It has been a long time since a passage of Scripture has beaten me up as badly as Psalm 91 has beaten me up the last month. I'll work on a couple hours until the head is splitting. So I got to sit this down and come back in a day or two. Come back to it, you know, and, and it's been about a month that I've been fighting with this psalm because at first blush, when you read it, I mean, we all know probably you have the first verse memorized, maybe not intentionally, but you know, he that dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. What a wonderful verse. What a comforting verse. He'll give his angels charge over thee. What a comforting verse. But you dig into this psalm and it's like, oh, how do you explain this? <laughs> you know? uh, and, and it is a challenging psalm, and I'm just going to be honest with you up front, that the title is Keep Calm Even in Troubled Times. I've had some troubled times working on this psalm. Um, but the good news is God speaks to us when we go through the troubles of life. We would like for God to absolutely protect us from any difficulties in life. It's not like that. Uh, I remember first church we pastored, there was an older gentleman um, who had traveled in, in song evangelism earlier in his life, and he sang a song that said, your roses may have thorns, but don't forget your thorns may have some roses too. So oh, that's kind of an interesting concept. But this psalm kind of has the thorns and the roses. And so we're going to dig in uh, to Psalm 91. Whoever dwells in the shelter of the Most High will rest in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. Surely He will save you from the fowler's snare and from the deadly pestilence. He will cover you with His feathers and under His wings you will find refuge. His faithfulness will be your shield and rampart. You will not fear the terror of night, nor the arrow that flies by day, nor the pestilence that stalks in the darkness, nor the plague that destroys at midday. A thousand may fall at your side, ten thousand at your right hand, but it will not come near you. You will only observe with your eyes and see the punishment of the wicked. If you say, The Lord is my refuge, and you make the Most High your dwelling, no harm will overtake you, no disaster will come near your tent, for he will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. They will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. You will tread on the lion and the cobra, you will trample the great lion and the serpent. Because he loves me, says the Lord, I will rescue him. I will protect him, for he acknowledges my name. He will call on me and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him. With long life, I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. This psalm really falls into two main categories, God's promises and our responsibilities. His promises, look at verses 14 through 16. Seven times he says, I will. I will rescue him. I will protect him. I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver and honor him. I will satisfy him with long life. I will show him my salvation. And that word salvation is the general word for deliverance. Now someone has said, and I know it wasn't me because it's alliterated and I don't do an awful lot of alliteration, but those seven I will statements in verses 14 through 16, as you read through the rest of the psalm, they really fall into four main themes in this psalm. The first is shelter, verses 1 and 2. He is my shelter, he is my refuge, he is my fortress. The word shelter means a place to hide from your enemies. It's good to have the Lord be your shelter. <laughs> a place to hide from your enemies. The word refuge means a place to run for safety. And the word fortress is often translated stronghold. Chuck Swindoll summarizes it like this. God has made possible 
a plan of insulation, not isolation. We live courageously on the front lines, claiming his insulation amid an evil environment. And don't overlook the word rest, where he says, uh, it's actually, um, will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. It, the word means rest. And often it is translated, like in the King James, the word abide. And as I was digging into that word, I found that it meant to stop for the night, which is kind of interesting. If you dwell in the shadow of the Most High, you will be able to rest for the night in the shadow of the Almighty. <sighs> you ever been on a trip and you thought you could make it home, but about you know 2 a.m. you realize we are not going to make it home, at least not safely. We need to stop for the night. We need to find a place. Maybe all of a sudden a, a heavy rainstorm comes up or something. You say, I got to get out of this. I got to rest for the night. That's the picture here. So the, psalm, the psalmist, and most people think that Moses probably wrote Psalm 91, that he's saying there are times in your life when you need to rest for the night. <laughs> the battles are intense. The storms are raging. The night is dark and you need a safe place to rest for the night. That's who God is. He is the shelter. He is the place to rest for the night. The second concept is in verses 5 through 8, and that's strength. Although I actually, if I were putting these together, and again, I didn't, but if I were putting these words together, I would have used the word courage instead of strength. But courage doesn't begin with an S, so the person used strength. But I think this is courage, you know, verse not fearing the terror of night or the arrows or the pestilence. You know, it's, it's the courage to face the darkness. Verses 9 through 13 talk about security and his angels guarding us. And we'll come back to verses 11 and 12 uh, because you may be familiar with those verses from Matthew chapter 4, the temptation of Christ. You know, he, he, they'll lift you up in your hand, they're in, your, in their hands, and you won't dash your feet against a stone. Uh, but it, it's the promise of security. And then verses 15 and 16, the promise of salvation. And one of the things you've got to wrestle with is verse 16, where he says, With long life I will satisfy him. What does that mean? Does that mean everybody's going to live to be 120? Well, obviously not. You may be new people who died at 40 and they had lived a long life. And you may have known people who died at 80 that didn't accomplish anything in their life. <laughs> and, and as I dug into this, the, the, the answer that I found that made the most sense to me is that long life can be defined as you will live long enough to accomplish what God wants you to accomplish. It's Jesus at 33 it was even young in his day, Jesus at 33, saying to the Father, I have finished the work you gave me to do. It is said of David in the book of Acts, he served his generation according to the will of God. So I do believe that when he's talking about long life, he's not talking about, you know, number of years. He's talking about the fact that God will preserve us until we accomplish what he wants to accomplish through us. Somebody asked me, uh, you know, when, when my mom was, you know, the last couple years of her life, just totally gone with Alzheimer's. And, and then, you know, all of a sudden, one day she dies. And it was like, why? You know, why not two years ago? And my answer to them was, apparently... There was still something that God wanted to do through her until that day. I don't know what it was, but God did. And so long life, again, that doesn't mean you can say, I'm going to live to 110. It means I'm going to be able with God's help to accomplish what he's put me here to do. And then I will show him my salvation. Again, the word is generally deliverance. That's the whole theme of this psalm is God's deliverance. 
So look at some of the illustrations of how Moses or whoever wrote this psalm tells us God's going to take care of us. Verses 3 through 13, I mean, it's just all kinds of stuff. There's snares and traps and pestilence and plagues and war and predators. But yet through the whole thing, there's a sense of calm because they know God and God is watching over them. And all kinds of different things that he uses, and we'll go briefly through them, shows us that God's protection over us is not limited to just a certain time or a certain place. But yet, all of these examples make it clear, if you're honest, that God does not isolate us from trouble. Now, you've heard me say repeatedly, I hope that you remember it, Jesus said, it rains on the just and the unjust. And sometimes the rain brings a harvest and unjust farmers reap a harvest. And sometimes the rain is a torrential storm and just people lose their properties just like the unjust people do. We need to understand that. God's protection over us does not isolate us or immunize us from going through difficulties. He does not say, you won't have terrors at night. He doesn't say that. He doesn't say, you won't be shot at by arrows. He doesn't say, you won't ever face lions. What he says is, God will ultimately protect you as you face the troubled times of life. And again, we're going to just dig into this a little bit later. In verse 3, he talks about a fowler snare and pestilence. The fowler snare is man-made danger. Pestilence is danger from nature. You know, disease, illness, plague, whatever. Verse 4, he will cover you with his feathers. Under his wings, you'll find refuge. Some believe that this concept of God's feathers as his protection or his wings as protection harkens back to the Ark of the Covenant and on either end of the Ark of the Covenant there was the wings, the, the wings symbolizing God's protection. And then you think about an eagle. Uh, Donna bought me, it was up on my bookcase, I looked at it several times as I was working on this. Of a, of a nest with an eaglet in the nest and the parent eagle over the nest with its wings outspread. Protection. The songwriter put, under his wings I am safely abiding. Now I can't talk about this verse without telling you a story that Donna told me that she found somewhere. <laughs> an older lady who lived in a, in a town that was increasingly becoming dangerous and she was fighting fear and when she read Psalm 91 she felt if I can memorize verse 4 he'll cover you with his feathers under his wings you'll find refuge if I can memorize that verse when I'm facing fear I'll quote that verse and it'll give me strength and one day she's walking into town to do her errands and a purse snatcher comes up and grabs at her purse, tries to rob her. And she's thinking, okay, I got to quote my verse. I got to quote my verse. She could not remember the verse in the panic, but she remembered feathers. And so she started saying, feathers, feathers. Feathers, feathers. The guy said, lady, you're crazy. Threw down the purse and ran away. Aren't you glad you don't have to know the whole verse for God to honor his promises? <laughs> but he said, he, he, he will cover you with his feathers. And under his wings, the NIV says, you'll find refuge. The King James says, you'll trust. And I dug into that word and I got excited. Because that word literally means to run for refuge. Here's what came into my spirit. 
Faith in this picture is pictured as running to God for refuge. Sometimes the devil and even other well-meaning people will tell us that if you always have to run to God for help, you must not have very strong faith. That if you had strong faith, you'd just be able to handle stuff. That's not what this verse says. The core of faith, the essence of faith, is running to God. It's recognizing, where does my help come from? It comes from the Lord who made the heaven and the earth. The core of faith, the essence of faith, is not trying to make it on your own. The essence of faith is not trying to say, see God, how much I can handle without you. No, the essence of faith is saying, God, you are my refuge. You are my fortress. I'm going to run to your wings for refuge. That ought to set you free. That the essence of faith is running to God for refuge. I've told you this story before, and, and I'm sure that I'll tell it to you again if I live long enough to preach on a similar passage again. Visiting my aunt and uncle on their farm. I mentioned a couple weeks ago the, the little creek that ran in the, in the backyard. But I remember distinctly, I was young, but this has stuck in my brain. And maybe it's already stuck in yours and you're already telling the story. That's okay, I don't mind. And a storm came up sweeping down over the mountains into the valley where that farm was. Skies just got dark. The wind started to blow. And that, that oppressive feeling in the atmosphere that we getting ready to have a major storm. And in that barnyard was a mother hen and some little chicks. And the mother hen started calling for her chicks. Those chicks did not say, Mama, I've got faith. I don't need you to protect me. I'm going to dig my little feet into the ground and I'm going to stand. No, they ran to Mama. And she lifted her wings and they got under her wings and she folded her wings down over them. That's faith. Faith isn't trying to make it on your own. <laughs> faith is is running to God. You're my refuge. You're my fortress. You're my stronghold. Run to God. God's graciously, as I was fighting in this psalm, led me to a sermon by Alexander McLaren. And in it he said this, Faith is the gathering up of the whole powers of my nature, to take shelter beneath the shadow of his wings. And in, in the King James in verse 4, it says, His truth will be your shield and rampart. It's better translated as the NIV translates it. His faithfulness will be our shield and rampart. We know what a shield is. A rampart was that coat of mail. You know, it's like the the um, armor you see standing up in the corner, you know, that, that coat of armor, that's what he's talking about. He said, that's God's faithfulness. I, I did not schedule to sing, Great is Thy Faithfulness, to tie in with this sermon, but it sure fit. Because God's faithfulness is our protection. We could run to him, we can run to the shelter of his wings because we know he is the faithful God. We can trust him. We can depend on him. He's always going to be there. Verse 5 talks about night or day. Verse 7 talks about a battlefield. Verse 6 talks about natural threats. In verse 8, he's saying there's going to come a time when God is going to set everything right. And an interesting insight, those who feel that Moses wrote this psalm thinks, suggests that verses 5 through 8, he may be reflecting back to the Passover, the night when the death angel came by 
and, and killed the firstborn of all of the Egyptians and the firstborn of all their things. And, and he's saying, God's going to protect you from the pestilence at night and the destruction that comes at night. It's, it's an interesting insight. Make you go, hmm, and maybe do some own study on your own. In verse 11, he talks about angels to guard us. That word means what you might expect it means, to take care of you and to lift you up, to bear you up. Somebody asked me a few weeks ago if I've ever done a, a sermon on angels. And my honest response was, I've tried to several times and could never get enough material organized enough in my own mind that, that I felt like it was you know, appropriate to even try to share it. But there's something, I mean, you need to study what the scripture says about angels. And he says they will bear you up, they will carry you up. There, there are ministering angels that will lift us up. And he says that they will take care of all your ways. And that word ways means all of your comings and goings, every detail, every situation of your life. And in verse 12, when he talks about not striking your foot against a stone, the word there can literally mean you won't stumble. <laughs> Between my vision failing and my back failing, walking has become a challenge. And I have to walk pretty much with my face down, looking at where I'm going to put my next step. Because if there's an unevenness, I'm going to lose my balance. And so I appreciate this verse, you know, that God's going to look out for us so that we won't stumble. And in and, and the Hebrew language, that was a metaphor for falling into misfortune. So God is going to watch over you so you don't stumble. And then in verse 13, the idea is protection from lions and, and cobras. He, he's not talking about you know, handling snakes, and we're going to talk about that in a couple minutes too. But, but he's talking about God protecting us from threats. Okay, those are God's promises. But you cannot deal honestly with this psalm without facing the question, but what about when it doesn't seem to be working? You know, what about when trouble comes? What about when terror comes? What about when bad things happen to good people? What about Christians who get sick and die? What about Christians who die in an accident? Was there something defective in their faith? No. A hundred million times, no. I'm going to give you another quote from Alexander McLaren. He writes this. It is of no use trying to persuade ourselves that believers won't have trouble. In fact, you read Chuck Swindoll on Psalm 91. He says, it is so obvious this can't be talking about protection from physical difficulties. I just think it's talking about spiritual battles and God's going to protect you spiritually. Well, you know, I don't know that I necessarily agree with that, but I can understand you know, why he says it because as McLaren says, don't even try to persuade yourself that believers won't have trouble. We shall understand God's dealings with us and get to the very throbbing heart of such promises as these in this psalm far better if we start from the certainty that whatever it means, it does not mean that with regard to external calamities and disasters, we're going to be God's petted children and be saved from the things that fall on other people. He says, and this was an interesting, this was something that made me stop and go, huh. He said the protection that God promises in this psalm is from the evil in the evil. In other words, he says, the protections, it's not God keeping us from trouble, but it's changing the character of the trouble so that they ultimately work for our good. Protecting us from the evil in the evil. Joseph to his brothers, you meant it for evil, God meant it for good. Tar and Wells song, Joy in the Morning. If it's not good, then he's not done. It's an interesting concept. 
But there are people who, in my opinion, misinterpret this psalm. And I mentioned to you, you may be familiar with that verse about, you know, God's angels protecting you so that you won't bother your, your foot won't fail. You remember Matthew 4, the temptation of Jesus in the wilderness? The devil quoted these verses to Jesus and said, Jesus, don't you know Psalm 91? That's the message translation. Don't you know Psalm 91? Don't you know that the psalmist says you can cast your, you can jump off and the angels will guard you and they'll protect you and they'll lift you up in your wings and, and you won't hurt yourself? Well, it is what the verse says. But you remember what Jesus did? Jesus said, it is written, and he quoted Deuteronomy 6, don't put your Lord to the test. Buckle your seatbelts here and just stick with me here for a minute. Jesus, in that instance, teaches us an important principle of how to interpret Scripture. You interpret Scripture with Scripture. The best commentary on any passage of Scripture is the Scripture. Scripture as a whole is coherent and consistent. So any verse or passage of Scripture that does not cohere with the rest of Scripture means you're not understanding one of those passages and you need to dig a little bit deeper. Verse 13 does not tell you you can go pick up poisonous snakes and wave them over your head and expect that God's going to protect you because it says you'll tread on the cobra. You probably know there are churches that believe that and that practice that. There aren't a whole lot of them left. And the ones that are left, they don't have a whole lot of people left. You know, because that's not what that verse means. You'll get that on the way home. But we need to understand that you interpret Scripture with Scripture. What about Job's life? What about Paul's life? What about how the disciples were martyred for their faith? What about Jesus' life? We need to understand Psalm 91 does not say you're never going to have trouble, you're never going to face troubled times, but he does promise that he will be with us during those times and we can trust in his love and his care and during the troubled times we can keep calm because we're abiding under the shadow of the Almighty and we're running to him for refuge. We need to understand, well, maybe not understand, maybe we can't understand, but we need to accept that what seems to be paradoxes for us don't bother God. For instance, God's promise of protection is not a promise of no trouble. I mean, it seems self-evident, but there are still churches around who tell you if you just had enough faith, everything would be great. Not so. God's promise of protection is not a promise of no trouble. It's a promise of deliverance in the midst of the trouble. You know Romans 8, 28, right? God is working in all things for the good of those who love him. Have you read verse 31 where he talks about nakedness and danger and peril and sword? Luke 21, verse 16, Jesus said, Not a hair of your head will perish. But two verses later in verse 18, he says, Some of you will die. I guess you'll die with a full head of hair. I don't know. But, but you know, those things seem paradoxes to us. They seem contradictions to us. They don't bother God. So please understand, this is not a promise that there won't be trouble. It's a promise God will be with us through the trouble. 
Here's McLaren again. And he's using an illustration of two men traveling on a ship across the Atlantic, which is how they traveled in his day. It says, here are two men on board a ship. The one puts his trust in God. The other thinks it's all nonsense to trust anything but himself. There's a crash. They both drown. Is drowning the same to the two? As they are lying side by side, you may say of one, but only of one, there shall no evil befall thee, neither shall any plague come near your dwelling. Because to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Oh, that just went all over me. And then you've got to go back to verses 7 and 8. About the thousand falling at your side, ten thousand by your right hand, it won't come near you. I was trying to picture that. I felt like if all these people are falling at my side, it's near me. <laughs> but, but it seems to be saying we're not always aware of God's protection. Ah, yeah. Now, sometimes we are. Donna almost drowned as a teenager. As an eighth grader, we lived in, on a busy city street. I was playing basketball in, in what little driveway we had. Lost control of the ball. It went out into the street. Stupid me. Just ran out after the ball. Car slams on his brakes. Lady on the sidewalk, she said, Son, you got an angel looking out for you. You know, sometimes we're aware of God's protection. But how many times are we not even aware of what God's protected us from? Somebody put it this way, more bad things have not happened to us than have, thanks to God's care. And we need to be grateful for the protection of God we are aware of, but we also need, I, I encourage you to start thanking God for his protections and blessings of which we're not even aware. I heard my dad pray one day, Lord, thank you for your blessings and protections, seen and unseen. Let, let's become a little more aware and a little more grateful that God protects us from things that unless he shows us in heaven, we'll never know he protected us from. 10,000 fallen over here, 1,000 fallen over here, and God's protection is over us and, and, and we're not even aware. <laughs> God's a good God. But we can't leave this psalm without looking at our responsibilities. Verse 9, if you say, the Lord is my refuge, and you make him your dwelling. That's an echo of the first verse. He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High. The word dwelling in both of those verses mean to remain, to abide, to make yourself at home. It has with it the idea of permanence. Somebody said this is a psalm for dwellers not commuters. <laughs> Have you ever been a commuter with God? You lived your own life with your own devices and to your own you know, ideas and not even thinking about God until you got in trouble. <laughs> and then you ran back to God. You commuted back to God. The promises of this psalm are for those who dwell, who make your home with God. A constant connection, daily fellowship with him, making yourself at home with God. And, and by the way, you know how you dwell, right? Jesus said in John 15 verse 10, if you obey my commands, you will abide, you will dwell in my love. And in verse 14 he says, because he loves me, and again, Jesus, John 14, if you love me, 
you'll keep my commandments. And this is an interesting word, love, here. Love him. And I put it in your notes. I, I, I've given you some more extensive notes today so that if you want to go back over this psalm, you will have them there. It, it means to be attached to, to cling to. And it was a word, the word love, it was a word that was used of attaching a saddle to a horse. <laughs> to cling to. To be attached to. Are you attached to God like a saddle to a horse? Are you holding on for dear life? That's the picture I've got. Just, you know, put your arms around him and just hold on tight. Love him. Again, faith is not trying to make it on yourself. Faith is running to him. And then he says, if you will acknowledge my name or if you'll know my name. The word know there is translated, I think, in the King James, or the acknowledge, it's maybe translated in the King James knows my name, but it's the same word that's used in Proverbs 3, in all your ways, acknowledge him, know him, put him first. Know his name. Is he first in your life? Know his name. Well, you know, we, we spend so much time talking about the names of God that I I wonder what names the writer uses here. And in verses 1 and 2, he uses four different Hebrew names for God. He uses Elion. That's the word translated most high. It literally means the owner of everything. God owns it all. That He owns me. He owns you. And he knows how to take care of what he owns. I like that. He watches over us. He is the most high. He knows how to watch over his own. The word almighty there in verse 1 is the word Shaddai, which means protector. God is watching over us. He is protecting us. And it's also a word that's used of giving nourishment to us. <laughs> God gives us the strength that we need, the nourishment that we need. He is Shaddai, the Almighty. Then he talks about, I will say, of the Lord. That's the word Jehovah. You may have known that. It's the personal God, the God that's interested in everything about us. I will say of the Lord, he is my God. And that's the word Elohim, which is used in Genesis 1 as creator. And it speaks of God's power. So here, in just these two verses, the writer says, here's the God that's going to look out for you. <laughs> he is the Most High, and He owns it all, and He knows how to take care of His own. He is the Almighty who will give you the nourishment and refreshing that you need. He is a personal God that cares about what you're going through, and He is the powerful God that spoke the worlds into existence and has the power that you need. Run to him for refuge. As I was thinking about this psalm, an old, old gospel song came to my mind, and it, the chorus is, standing somewhere in the shadows, you will find him. He's a friend who always cares and understands. Standing somewhere in the shadows, you will find Jesus, and you'll know him by the nail prints in his hands. There are shadows. There are terrors by night. There's pestilence by day. But in the midst of it all, there is a God who loves us and cares for us and watches over us. And if we will run to him for refuge, if we will dwell in his presence, we will live under the shadow of the Almighty. The message paraphrases verses 14 and 15. If you'll hold on to me for dear life, says God, I'll give you the best of care if you'll only get to know and trust me. Hmm. I wish, on a very shallow human level, 
that God would just protect us from everything. And that we just kind of go through life in a bubble, you know. But then, you know, the devil would have every right to say to God what he said to him about Job. Well, he's just serving you because you're protecting him from everything. God wants us to love him because of who he is. He wants us to trust him because of who he is. And as we go through the troubled times of life, run to Jesus. Don't try to see how strong you can be on your own. You're going to lose every time. But if you run to him, under his wings, <laughs> safely abide, put your refuge in him, put your trust in him, his faithfulness will protect you through the troubled times of life. And Father, how thankful we are for that. Because troubles come. You, Jesus, you went through them. Job went through them. Joseph went through them, being lied on and in prison for 13 years. The heroes of the faith went through them. I don't know why we think we should not have to face them. But Lord, we're so thankful we don't have to face them alone. We're so thankful for the promise that you are with us, watching over us, protecting us, and protecting us from the evil that the devil intends for the troubled times to do to us. But indeed, you can work in all of it for our good and your glory. We thank you for it. Lord, where our brains can't figure out all of this, may our spirits find their rest in you. And now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May he make his face to shine on you and give you his peace now and evermore. Amen. God bless you. Thanks for tuning in. Thanks for being here today. And you're dismissed.